now, who's going to round off with a general rural update. Thanks, Shannon. So we thought a good point to start with after Shannon's planning update would be looking at diversification. So with the loss of direct payments, now's a really good time to review alternative income sources. But we would urge that you consider all factors before you start work. So as Shannon just said, it's much easier to go for a change of use under permitted development than under full planning. But if you have begun the conversion, we can't go for permitted development. You should also consider tax before you start and speak to your accountant. Again, this is something that's difficult to do retrospectively. And when actually looking at the diversification itself, you should consider who the end user is going to be, what the demand in your area is like, how it's going to impact on your cash flow, and if you're going to need to borrow any money to undertake the work, and also if there's any niche markets you can tap into. We can't have a Robinson and Hall presentation without touching on tax especially as it's increasingly in the press at the moment due to the growing national debt following the coronavirus outbreak. It might not feel like it, but the current tax regime is relatively kind. And the next budget is coming in March 2021, and we're expecting that we could see tax increases from then. The Office of Tax Simplification undertook a review of inheritance tax in 2019, and they've just finished a consultation on capital gains tax. One of the suggested changes in the inheritance tax review was the removal of the capital gains tax uplift on death. So currently, if you inherit property, you inherit it at the deceased person's probate value. If you then sell it swiftly afterwards, and it's at a similar value, no capital gains tax will be payable. The plan with the removal of the uplift on death is that you would inherit at the deceased's base value. So if you then sold the property, you would pay capital gains tax on the difference between the price you sell it at and the original base value. This could have quite a big impact on the amount of tax due. There's also more and more talk in the press that wealth taxes are going to come in. So if you're making or planning business or ownership changes, our suggestion would be that you move forward with these swiftly and make the most of the current tax regime rather than what might be coming in the future, which could be less favourable. The government remain keen to invest in infrastructure and development to keep employment figures up and to aid the economy. They've recently published their national infrastructure strategy and that showed that their commitment to development in the Oxford Cambridge arc remains, despite political pressure to move investment up north. They reiterated the commitment they made in the budget in 2020 to prepare a spatial framework for the Oxford Cambridge arc area, including looking at options for development corporations. And they confirmed that funding remains for East West Rail. Similarly with tax changes, our advice is to consider any opportunities that come to you now, as the income from development could be higher now than it would be under development corporations or if there's a fixed rate for development land made in the future. I just thought I'd touch briefly on telecoms, as many of you will have a telecoms mast on your property. And following the introduction of the telecommunications code in 2017, we've seen very few new lease agreements or renewals complete. However, with increasing pressure on operators to roll out 5G networks, they are now beginning to serve notice for tribunal where rents cannot be agreed. Many landowners have been reluctant to agree the rents which have been put forward by the operators under the new code as it changed the rent mechanism from one of open market value to one based more on the existing use value. Some operators took this literally and suggested rents based on the agricultural value of a corner of an arable field, which gave very low rents. 
and landowners wouldn't agree. We are now seeing more decisions coming out of the tribunal and they are tending to find in favour of the operator rather than the landowner, but not at the very low rents which were initially suggested. However, on average, the rents proposed are probably only a quarter of the current rents that have been received. So they are going to go down. My advice would be don't agree the first offer as operators have to show that they have undertaken negotiations if they're to get a successful re result at tribunal. And also operators will pay towards landowners costs. So don't be afraid to take advice. Any of you who own and let residential and commercial properties should know about the minimum energy efficiency standards. So all let residential properties should have an energy performance certificate of E or above. And this will also apply to new lettings or to, it already applies to all commercial properties newly let and will apply to all existing tenancies from the 1st of April 2023. You can apply for an exemption, but if you haven't got a property with an EPC of E or above or an exemption, then you are liable to penalty. You should also be aware that the government are talking of increasing the standards with the suggestion perhaps of properties requiring a rating of C or above by 2030. I think this is likely to come in as the government have signed up to ambitious carbon reduction targets. So you should take this into account if you're improving properties now so that you don't have to go back in and improve them again if the ratings do change by 2030. My last point is on rights of way. So many of you will have noticed increasing members of the public in the countryside since lockdown happened. And there are two ways which they can make claims for new public rights of way. The first of these is to find old routes on historic maps and claim them as a right of way. The British Horse Society are making a push to members to look to do research on historic maps and look for routes like this under what they're calling Project 2026. So as an example, just in Bedfordshire, there are 182 paths under review and of these 49 have already been submitted to the council as potential new rights of way. There's very little you can do if the evidence is there that that was a historic route. But the other way that members of the public can claim a new public right of way is to prove that they have used it for in excess of 20 years and to prove that they've done that without secrecy, without force and without consent. Just putting a no public right of way sign is good evidence towards proving that you didn't give consent. So you should make sure that existing public rights of way are well signed and that you have no public rights of way signs where you don't want people to go. I'd suggest keeping records of these signs when you put them up, take a photo of them each year to prove they're there, as you can then use that as evidence if you need to refute a claim in the future. Another way of protecting your land is to submit a Section 31 deposit to the local council. So this shows the rights of way in place on a property on a given date and states that a landowner doesn't want to make any new rights of way. That then draws a line in the sand so no new periods of 20 years use can begin. So I think that's enough from us and hopefully we've given you quite a good update on a few things that are happening. I think we've got a question, but I'm going to hand back over to Andrew and he can run through them. Do you want to read through them, Polly? Um, so as I said at the beginning, if you'd like to ask a question, if you go to the bottom, you should be able to see a Q&A and you can type your question in there. The question we've got so far is for Shannon. So, Polly, do you want to read it out and Shannon will answer? Is there a <laughs> limit on how many times you can use class A? In terms of a limit, I wouldn't say there's a limit per se. There are just two points you need to sort of bear in mind. So if you have built an agricultural building using class A, to build another one, 
you either need to be over 90 metres away from the building or you need to wait two years to then apply for another building. Okay, great. Do you want to answer? We've got another question, Paula. The next one is, do you have a value per hectare for biodiversity offsetting? So on biodiversity offsetting, we are actually starting to see it. Um, I've been involved in a number of schemes on the East West Rail, where as part of their, well, their submission for the Transport and Works Act order, they needed to prove that they had biodiversity offsetting in place. So we have seen some per acre figures where they've been looking for a 30 year commitment and it's tended to be about double to triple agricultural value depending on what we're going to do. That's for sort of five to acres plus. We've also seen though on East West Rail again and on HS2, some smaller sites, which have been done by negotiation for things like badges, where the payment has been significantly more on a per acre basis. Okay, can one section 31 deposit cover multiple land parcels? Uh, yes, you have to do one uh, a separate statement per ownership but if you own several blocks of land you can do one deposit for each of those ownership for all of those ownership um, will the new elm schemes make payment for schemes already underway or will they be for new projects so in general there should be certainly the sustainable farming incentive will be for things already underway under the next two tiers, so certainly there will be some payments for keeping things that are already there, similar to the mid-tier scheme. So if you take the mid-tier scheme, the six meter margins, you're allowed to just keep rolling them on. It was actually a question that I was debating with a client last night about things like wild bird seed mixtures, which have to be replaced every two years, can they be rolled on? But also things like pollen and nectar mixes that are well established we yet to have the detail, like we're yet to have for the rates, but certainly if something's well established, what we've seen from the current transition from ELS HLS to countryside stewardship is people have perhaps not tried too hard to re-establish them. They've just perhaps run the seed over the top. We'll have to see on the detailed rules though, which options they'll allow to be just rolled on and which will have to be newly established. So the question is, um, on the um, single payment, there was talk of rounding all payments in one go payment. Okay, so I think what that question was about is about the ability to take a lump sum. So there will be the ability to take a lump sum, but that will be on the condition that you retire from farming, which we're yet to see what conditions will come with that. I think the Treasury will begin to get a bit scared about the majority of farmers all taking their lump sum payment in 2022 and 2023 and the cost to the treasury of that at the time that perhaps they're already borrowing quite a lot of money. Okay, how do you think the changes in support and new environmental schemes will affect rents? I'll give you my view and Polly can give you hers. My view is that certainly we're already beginning to see an effect on rents a couple of years ago, we, you know, we might have been seeing rents between 130 to 160 an acre on FPTs. They're beginning to come back to the bottom of that range. With the BPS, well, when you look at the Derek for policy papers, there's hundreds of pages of them. One of their comments in there was that they feel that the BPS has been artificially inflating rents. So certainly FPT rents, I think, will fall back. AHA rents, so agricultural holding out tenancies, the long-term lifetime tenancies, that's going to be a bit more difficult because that's, we're looking at the related earning capacity and the productive capacity of the holding. BPS has traditionally gone in there, but when you've got more options about environmental schemes, you know, for example, if you've got poor quality land and you enter into the environmental scheme, would a prudent turn do that? It's going to be hard to predict, harder to predict than the FPT rents. Polly might totally though disagree. 
No, I agree. I think it will it will depend on what um, the payment rates are under Elms, and we I mean we're already looking at how we update our farm business tenancy agreement that we use to factor in environmental schemes in more detail than we have in the past. It's a question for you, Shannon. Does the new do the new planning protocols impact extensions to renewable energy installations? Or it's quite specific. This so. is quite specific. I probably wouldn't be able to answer on renewables, but if you are able to leave some contact details, I can speak to my colleague Abel in the planning department and hopefully he can help. Sorry about that. We've got we've got your details, Martin, you can ask. I think that's it. Oh, sorry, hang on. Will there be any further incentives for tree planting on larger scales? I think definitely would be my answer to that. We're already starting to see this. Um, so the DEFRA announced yesterday that there is going to be projects in new forests, so Marston Vale being the obvious one, where there's you know, 8.4 billion million to encourage new tree planting. The government's made a big thing about tree planting and about the ability to store carbon in trees. So undoubtedly there's going to have to be significant incentives. I think that's where the landscape change comes, so the top tier realm. They'll be keen to establish new forests. Personally, you know, if you do look, start looking at the research, you can see that soils actually have the potential to store far more carbon through increasing organic matter than trees. But it's good and easy sell for the government to talk about tree plant. Okay. Um, if you were considering investing in a new slurry system, would you advise that we hold off? And if we can't hold off, will they look back at any recent investments? So, answering the second part of that question first, we tend to see that they won't back take things. If you are looking at a new slurry system, these things take time to design well. We're expecting that scheme isn't very far away. So probably by the time you've designed it and then reposition, we'll know far more about what that scheme will fund and where to go with it. Um, what is like is likely to be the impact on land values in the reduction to BPS and changes in to the tax regime? Ouch. <laughs> okay, so land values in terms of BPS, the consistent answer I give on this is that nationally land values are falling, but certainly not in our area. On the outer sort of southeast, which the vast majority of the people on this call are in, we continue to see significant demand, mainly due to rollover and people looking to reinvest. So up till now, you know, we've sold quite a lot of land this year and it's been at a higher values than last year, similar values to 2018. Going forward, agricultural profitability and land values have never been related. So it shouldn't have too much an effect BPS. Tax changes though could have a much more significant impact if they introduce their wealth tax. So every time, and get rid of agricultural property relief, which is one of the ideas being discussed, then that would have a dramatic effect as people are taxed, farmers are taxed on death. There would have to be far more land brought to the market, which on supply and demand, you would think would result in prices decreasing. It would depend what tax changes they make. You know, they may just tweak APR, so agricultural property relief, they may get rid of agricultural property relief and just rely on business property relief, which would mean that the only thing really that affects the trading farmers would be on the farmhouse, or they may make far bigger changes. Inheritance tax and capital gains tax produce very little return to the treasury, but they are very good on a PR basis. And that's why personally our view is that they may be up for significant change in the coming years. When we're talking about the red wall and up north, it's far easier to talk about taxing the rich landowners in the south. And so they may become a target, even though 
a 1% change in corporation tax would raise far more money for the Treasury. We're getting quite a lot of questions, so I think Polly's starting to answer them <laughs> as she can by typing. What's the next one, Paul? Um, how does agroforestry fit into any new schemes and are there any extra payments available? Okay, so agroforestry is currently available under countryside stewardship in the separate forestry section. When they introduced the countryside stewardship scheme, I really hoped it was going to become more integrated so that farmers could look at agroforestry as long with wildlife strips and things. They didn't go there. My suspicion with elms is that it will be much more tightly together because of the government's target to meet these, this tree planting, that they will tie tree planting in with the more normal options and the new options about air quality and things like that. So that's that is it, yeah. Okay. Well, I hope everyone's enjoyed tonight. Just a few very quick last thoughts for me. Change is coming. DEFRA wants change. Please embrace change. Unfortunately, the banks are beginning to force change. So over the last three years, with my Agricultural Mortgage Corporation agent hat on, I've applied for over hundred million pounds worth of refinancing to the AMC as people look to move to long-term finance, which can't be broken. If you have a part amortization loan, which is a loan which, although it might be for a 25 year term, is reviewed every five years, start thinking carefully now about when your next review is and what your cash flow may look, be looking like. The talking to a number of mortgage brokers, I understand that declines with credit on most of the high street banks have jumped in the last few months, and most high street banks have changed their credit policy. So we've got potential DEFRA pushing for change. We've certainly got the banks pushing for change, and potentially we've got HMRC pushing for change. Farming is about to go through 10 years of change, a bigger 10 years of change than it's gone probably through in the last 30 years. Um, please embrace it. Please think about the opportunities. They've freed up the planning system as Shannon's demonstrated. Think about diversification. Think about what your skills are. Finally, two points. This has been an incredibly tough year on everyone. Farming is an incredibly tough environment to be in anyway. With the added, added stress of COVID, please just consider you and your loved one's mental health. We all need breaks. We all need to switch off. And finally, I'd like to wish you all a Merry Christmas. I hope you've enjoyed tonight. Again, I'm sorry that we can't be in person, but I hope to see you all in the new year. And we will email the slides round. And hopefully the presentation just depends how big a file it is, but we'll definitely email the slides around in the next couple of days. Thank you. Take care, everyone.